Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Lineup with Dave Prodan. I'm Dave Prodan, and welcome to Episode 5. If you haven't already, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We're building a little bit of a back catalog, and these are going to continue to drop every Friday. Additionally, our buddies at WSL Pure have recently launched the One Ocean podcast, where they talk to activists and artists, athletes, academics about ocean conservation and sustainability and what we can do to save the seas. So please search WSL Pure One Ocean in your podcast app of choice. Let's get into it. Episode five. Not all superstar ultra groom junior talents end up on the championship tour. The odds of becoming a competitive surfer at any level are really small for the broad scope of humanity that end up ever picking up a surfboard. From there, that already tiny pool only sees a fraction of them take on the Pro Junior Series. And from there, an even smaller group have a crack at the qualifying series. And beyond that, a small, small select group ever qualify for the big show that is the championship tour. We could go on, but you get the point. However, it's also worth acknowledging and accepting and even celebrating that the trajectory of a quote-unquote pro surfer isn't always necessarily to eventually battle for the world title. For some, the value they see in their own personal and professional development isn't exclusive to the ideas of winning or money or fame or any of these very reasonable human motivations that can drive an individual across any dimension of sport. Occasionally, actually for a significant portion of the surfing world, the opportunities provided them by virtue of a professional surfing profession can lead to some really interesting places. This is a huge part of what makes surfing so special. What does the professional surfer, competitive or not, do on their day off? They probably surf, and that's a really important distinction. And whether you're a free surfer or a competitive surfer or likely both, a good portion of the magic comes when these elements interact with one another as opposed to being quarantined off from one another, which is why I'm beyond excited to introduce today's guest, someone who was groomed amongst a crop of Americans poised to take on the world, who claimed the 2004 NSSA Open Men's Title at Lowers, which was then the benchmark identifier for future talent, someone who was a multi-year QS journeyman, has pushed the envelope in the heavy waters of Hawaii, has innovated in the surfboard design space, and has co-founded philanthropic organizations as well as started youth programs, and now resides in the rarefied air of professional free surfer of substance. Please enjoy the lineup's conversation with the positive vibe warrior, Dane Godowskis. The good old clap, take one. That's right. <laughs> How many of you knew what you wanted to be when you were seven years old? I did. I wanted to be a world champion. Hey, is there honesty involved in this podcast? Can we be honest? You can shut your fucking lips. And then I'll just say, put them up once. Let's go. He's like, you look too pretty on the wave. Get ugly. We can talk about DMT if you want. Let's talk to your boxes. <laughs> okay, so thank you for coming back. Round two at doing this. Yes. Um, I thought that like an interesting entry point would just be for you to describe what is your day job at the moment? Oh, wow. How do you approach your year? Who's your employer? How, how do you go about planning your, your week to week and your day to day? Wow, I, I've honestly haven't thought about putting a label to anything. <laughs> There's so many things, but yeah, I'm just Dane from San Clemente, California. And um, it's awesome. I ride for Van Surf, which has been fantastic. Almost ridden for them for probably 17 years now. And uh, it's just been a fantastic relationship. Um, and they've helped me in the evolution of my career kind of translate from competing growing up in the NSSAs and getting into QS level events with my brothers. And and then I took a path about 10 years ago where I, I wanted something new and, and I wanted to grow in different areas. And you know, Scott Sismus and Doug Palladini, they, those guys were all on board and they supported me and my brothers in our individual pursuits. And, and since then, it's been a, a really interesting journey of, I mean, I, I wake up each day and going, I, I, you, if you think it, you can do it. There's literally nothing holding you back except for, you know, 
the food you got in your stomach to go, oh man, like this is what I'm feeling passionate about today. And I can go and explore it and learn it. And I wouldn't even know how to describe it. I mean, I surf still, I'm a free surfer. You know, I travel to new destinations, cold water places, big waves, um, interesting board designs, um, basically just exploring all the spectrums of surf. But I also run the Positive Vibe Warriors Foundation with my brothers, which gives back to youth water safety programs and emerging surf cultures. Um, in the five years that that's been going on, we've raised over $100,000 for uh, junior lifeguard programs and youth water safety programs and donated over a thousand surfboards to emerging surf culture. So, I mean, just activating those um, scenarios and kind of dreaming up the possibilities and making the relationships happen. And yeah, I mean, that's what I do on the daily, you know, it's that, a, that's bullshit that you haven't thought of that. That's like the best answer. No, <laughs> it's just like rattled it off. Very articulate. Uh, well, I don't know. I have a lot of time to think. Man. <laughs> No, it's fun. Uh, I trip sometimes. I wake up and I'm like, uh, but in saying that, I'm never really bored and, I'm, and there's something to do always. And it's not like I ever have like a space in my life where I'm like, wow, what am I doing? You know, it's crazy. Well, and I think that's I think that's kind of what would be interesting to talk about, too, because I think a lot of people like say they get exposed to you tomorrow through social media or an advertisement or a piece of content or something. They go like, wow, like this guy's like living the life, but it was a huge journey for you to get to this point. Oh yeah. In a lot of ways. And, um, you know, you're 33, I'm 30, <laughs> similar <laughs> generations. Right. And, um, we grew up in the same, same area. Um, so we've known each other for a long time, but we were talking about this the other day about how really you and your twin brother, Patrick, and your younger brother, Tanner, along with all these generations of Orange County kids in the you know, late 90s, were really doing amateur events, the NSSA, and grooming themselves to take a run at qualifying for the tour. That was the pathway for being a professional surfer at the time. Does that gel with your experience? Yeah, that, it, I mean, yeah. I mean, like we were just talking earlier about surf movies and watching them before your heats at the NSSA when it'd be, you know, low tide uh, onshore slop at Huntington Beach. And, you know, around three in the afternoon, you turn on a surf movie, you're with your bros. And you got to get fired up for the heat. And I think what drew me to com competition in the early stages was the camaraderie aspect. It was like, that's where you went and hung out with your friends and my brothers were doing it. And it felt like a healthy place to, um, to push your surfing. You know, you're surfing with the best kids in the area. And by virtue of that, you're going to improve naturally. I wouldn't say I was a born winner. <laughs> I don't think, I think I only won two contests in my whole life. Um, which ended one of them ended up being a national championship for the NSSA, which was fantastic platform to kind of jump from. Mm. But yeah, the headspace, I mean, Patrick was so much more driven in a sense of like, he knew what he wanted to do. He wanted to get on tour and he wanted to activate on that global stage. And I was more along for the ride and exploring it and hanging out with everyone and just getting the, the vibe going. And anytime I get in the heat, I kind of lock up a little bit and I always felt a little nervous, you know, and never really identified with that essence of it. And it kind of started from the early age. I think I just was so stoked on the camaraderie aspect of competing. And But yeah, that whole generation, I mean, look, you got Simpo came out. He's now the Olympic coach. Phenomenal talent. I mean, Reynolds just being able to surf in the amateur events and Dane would come down and surf. And um, it was a really exciting time, not only in California, but on the East Coast, too. We had some great surfing talents. And in Hawaii, too, TJ Barron, Kiko, Bacalso, Dustin, Kuzan. And, I mean, it was red hot. And, uh, yeah, it was, <laughs> I was just like, this is what I want to do. I want to be a surfer. But I didn't know the extent of what direction that would take me. I didn't think there were a lot of... I mean, there's always been different avenues, but there wasn't, it wasn't as fully formed as it is now. But I do want to go back to you, one of your major wins, because that really was the North American benchmark for, as you said, a platform to jump off in your career. And that was the NSSA Nationals at Lower Trestles. And you won that in 2004. Patrick won it in 2003. He actually beat Dane Reynolds, because I was working at the surf shop at the time. I remember that whole, whole thing went down. But yeah, I mean, it, it, I find it kind of mind blowing that someone like yourself is saying, yeah, I just liked hanging out with my friends and trying to get better. But you still won arguably the most important amateur event in America, if not kind of the world, because the surf industry is based here. Yeah, I mean, it was something that very, very important to me and, and I aspired to, to do it, you know, and we went 
through high school, which, you know, and we we're on the surf team. And back then it was a different landscape. It wasn't like too many people were homeschooling and you weren't like this groomed protege. I mean, there were essentially a couple, but not as much like you weren't starting at eight years old, farming up the talent and getting it going. I mean, it was, it felt like a longer bell curve and even the expectations were like, Hey, you know, companies that were supporting you would be like, Oh yeah, if it takes you four years on the QS or five years, that's a realistic goal to get onto the CT. I mean, Bobby Martinez took a long time. I mean, we're talking phenomenal talents, spending a lot of time on the QS traveling at the time, there was about 30 contests a year that you travel and do. So, I mean, I think the curve, the arc was longer in time that you had to do it, but the, the national title was super special for me. I think it gave me a sense of confidence in, in, in terms of I can hang with my peer group and it just allowed me to kind of feel comfortable in my surfing skin. So you're 17, 18 when you win that event. And yeah. at, at that point, you're, you're wrapping up high school. Is your mind going, all right, I'm going to have a real run at the QS and see how it goes with, with my brother. Is that, is that, was that where you're at? Or like, how, how was that experience for you on the, on the qualifying series? It was um, interesting that you say that because we were talking. So Pat won in 2003, like you said. And I won in 2004, which is crazy. We were, I was tripping. And then, um, so the next Who, year- we, Who'd you beat? Do you remember? Uh, TJ Barron, Killian Garland was in it. Um, I can't remember. Kellen Ellison. Um, it was fun. It was about three foot lowers. I got a couple good rights. Had a really good MBM from Channel Islands. And I just went backside and just, whoo. It was, no, it was a rush. They didn't stand a chance. Oh, I was, I don't know. I just blacked out. I was so <laughs> but, um, but it was cool. But then, yeah, so we, you know, we graduated that year from high school. And we didn't also something not everyone does anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but we were really proud of that. And um, the education part of our growth was was huge. It was a big part, a uh, role in our life. And our mom and dad always instilled, you know, school's number one and surfing is just for fun. And, and at the time we were getting some base level support. It wasn't as if um, we weren't, you know, going out and buying cars or anything. You know what I mean? It was it was more just helping you along on the journey, allowing you to travel. And and we had the opportunity to compete domestically. There was a great uh, three stars and four stars on the East Coast. And we were actually taking some classes at Saddleback College, the junior college, which was actually a really um, pivotal time in our growth. And, and just, I mean, it teaches you about time management and exploring the different things out there, you know, whether it's music and education and English and math and kind of finding different pathways through that. But yeah, so Pat got on a heat heater, you know, on the East Coast and on these three stars. And all of a sudden we're like, wow, he's making heats. We'd fly out, we'd have class finish on Thursday and we fly out on Friday and and then get back on Sunday night and be ready for class on Monday or something like that. And then it got to a point where we were like, okay, let's do uh let's do online classes the next six months. And then Patrick was just ripping in these heats and making a bunch of them. And I was enough to stay buoyant. And uh, so we're like, hey, man, we, we may have a go here. We may have an opportunity to get into these big events traveling internationally. So after that first year of doing college, we, we stepped aside from the education and we just hit the road full time. It is. It, it does seem like it's one of those things. I think it's awesome that you guys at least approached it. And obviously you talk about your parents and like a strong family backbone in terms of like diversifying your interests and making sure you're well balanced. But it does feel like that was a pivotal time in surfing and you can kind of fast forward to today where it, there's benefit in terms of performance to being singularly focused, but maybe you do lose something in terms of whatever the experience is, the high school experience or just, you know, feeding your mind and body kind of different things and just a hundred percent one thing. Absolutely. I mean, we talked about this the other day, just about the social skills that you're, you're able to develop in an education place like school where not everyone's you know, your friend, like when you're at a homeschool environment, it's fairly insulated from my experiences with people who have had it. And, you know, the exposure to people of uh, different ways of thinking, and maybe there's bullies, and maybe there's friends, and then you have the popular kids and X, Y, and Z. And it kind of just helps you integrate into a world that would allow you to handle reality better. You know, like not everything you get, you get a lot of people skills out of the education system. That's, you know, for me, was super hugely valuable. Because you're going around the world after that, traveling all these places, and you know you're engaging with lineups and communities that kind of, you know, there's the same characters from the high school 
everywhere around the world. And you just kind of, you understand how it kind of works and you're able to kind of handle those situations on a bigger scale. So, I mean, not only are you feeding your mind with, uh, you know, cool new things about how to, you know, write a good essay or, um, I was turned on a lot by, I took a cool history of jazz class. It really opened my mind up to music and all sorts of things like that. And, um, I mean, I think that's hugely valuable, but I think too, in saying that, that the education you get on the road is, is second to none. And, um, so having both of them and letting them play off each other was, was a really special thing. So when you guys made the decision to focus on the QS, how did that go? And then at what point did Tanner join you guys? Cause he, he was only, he's not, he's only like three years younger than you guys. Right. So he, he got in the mix probably not too far after you guys. Yeah, Tanner was right behind us. Um, he was surfing insane and it was so fun. We were really excited. We were like eagerly awaiting when Tanner would get on the road with us, you know? And uh, at the time we were just traveling around with a bunch of the really fun American guys. Um, Nate Yeomans was a great person. Austin Ware, uh, Dylan Graves, um, my brothers, Gabe Kling, Sean Burrell, Mike Todd, Shay Lopez like all these guys. And it was really a really fun time in terms of camaraderie and people being there for each other and cheering each other on. And I made some great relationships, like lifelong friends competing. And you basically lived out your suitcase and, and surf some great waves. You know, the, the QS at the time had, you know, venues like Thurso East and um, Durban was red hot. Uh, Lowers was beautiful. Six Star Prime. Uh, it was, it was just a fantastic time. And getting to hang out with everyone and just talk story and, and really bonding with other people in other countries and everyone's there for a certain kind of reason. And yeah, you go to battle in the heat and, but afterwards it's just, you're, you're together and you have to survive together and you depend on one another. And it created a really good uh, team essence, you know, regardless of where you came from. Yeah. I think that's something that's like, you can kind of see it in different generations too. Like in the the nineties, there was like a really strong Australian contingent on tour that uh, on the QS, you know, the, and, and on the CT, I guess, where they were just trying to help each other kind of win in the water, but then there was kind of a support mechanism for each other and they kind of become an extended family. Y you talked about your crew and and how that contributed to success. You can see it now with the Brazilian storm and uh, like a real similar thing with your guys, was there like a lot of like parents or team managers or coaches or dietitians no. or was it just, it oh man, it's kind of different to now, I guess in a little bit. Yeah. I mean, we were thinking the same philosophy that you wanted to perform your best too. So we would be helping each other. You'd be reading books about, you know, sports psychology or, you know, what you can do for fitness and, and you'd be sharing and bouncing these ideas off one another. But that's all we had was that team around us. Um, whereas now it's, it's evolved, you know, it's, and it's not better or worse. I mean, uh, I think at the end of the day, these guys are on such a high level now that they're fueling themselves with the ability to prolong their, you know, or sustain that high level of surfing for event to event to event. But Back then it was pirate radio, you know, we, <laughs> we would get in the car and you'd have a map and you didn't know how to drive stick shift and you'd be in a country where you didn't know the language and you had to get to your heat <laughs> and yet, then you had to make sure your boards made it. And it was so, I mean, looking back on it, fairly primitive compared to exactly what's happening today. So, I mean, those times are invaluable. I wish I could go back in time <laughs> and, and, and do it again. I, I do think you do lose something. I mean, even having done this for, you know, 14 years, like Lane Beachley taught me how to drive stick shift because I talked myself into one of those wicked camper vans. Oh, didn't, wow. Didn't know it was the stick shift. And I had I had to get it down to Sydney and no one was going to go with Did me. Did they have so. the Chuck Norris uh, quotes on that? It had saying? it had um, Steve Irwin. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> and um, and yeah, and she's like took 15 minutes of her day up and do so. She's like, works like this. And I'm like, OK, thanks. But it's the same thing. Like, I, I mean, I remember getting a plane ticket. It only took you 15 minutes to learn stick shift. Is that? I'm not saying I, I'm not <laughs> saying I know how, but I got it down to Sydney. Uh, a few roundabout terrors, but it's a story for another day. But but I think, you know, when, when I started, they're like, here's your plane ticket. Make sure you get your passport. You've got to be at the event on this day. There's no map. There's no GPS. The, you know, you don't speak the language necessarily. And you kind of just have to figure it out. And it's there's a lot to it compared to... What I have seen now with some people just being like, who's picking me up and what time? And like, is my food going to be prepared and these things? And it's like, 
I get that all that helps. And obviously, you know, technological advancements and GPS and stuff are handy. But I do think you kind of lose a little bit of self-reliance when you don't have that, right? When you're not thrown into the deep end. Yeah. And, and I think that just goes back to the bigger picture of, of, of life, essentially. And surfing is a tool to teach you these skill sets to allow you to grow as a human being, not necessarily all the time for every single person as a number one champion. You know, for me, it's been huge the effective to be thrown in the deep end in these circumstances and and figure out how to handle yourself. And it just teaches you how to grow up essentially. And it's super valuable stuff. And that goes back to even school, which is so helpful. It's just, I can't encourage that enough for the, the next generation coming up. Just be open-minded to it. You know, I think there's, yes, the carrots out there. You can go for the title and everyone, you have to believe you can win a title to win a title, I think. You know, I mean, yeah. I didn't get to that level, but I can only imagine that you can't have any doubts when you're moving into that space. You got to go for it. But I think staying open-minded and and appreciating the opportunity to learn in so many different capacities will only help you as you grow up into a human. And at one point, you won't be a pro surfer anymore. That's just the reality unless you're, you know, 60. I don't know. I've never met a pro surfer after, you know, 55. So <laughs> essentially, everyone has to grow up sometime. Well, yeah. I mean, that's really interesting. I, I mean, we talked about the Brazilian storm as it is currently in the, I suppose this would be mid oddies, late oddies when you were doing the QS, were there any sort of forerunners that you noticed from Brazil on the QS that you're like, wow, like it feels like something's changing. Like there's some real hitters coming through the ranks. Oh man. I always just appreciated the energy they brought. I mean, I remember going to Fernando de Noronha with, and Pedersen Rosa was on fire. He was doing some big floaters backside and they had the passion that was unrivaled. Um, Neko Gilherme was surfing. So that generation was was thriving. Um, and beneath them, Adriano was surfing. I actually had a fun heat with him in a junior contest at Bells um, in the formative years. But man, he was electrifying to just to watch, to see that in person. Um, you knew it was coming. Their intensity is just second to none. I just always appreciate how much they want to uh, want to give it their all. You know, and I've I identified with that 100%. You know, I felt like, you know, you got to bring the energy and and you got to want to be there. And I always look towards the Brazilian community in the in the contest arena that those guys left it all in. You know, I, and I Adriano was definitely one in the next generation where I was like, oh my god, that's that guy's gonna be around for a long time. Yeah, and he really kind of fell like in that in between stage between your Pattersons and your um, Necos. Yeah. And then Gabrielle and Felipe, right? And he he had to carry a big load between those two groups in a lot of ways. You know, he was kind of the first mega title contender, like challenge Schlater during the 2010 season, like took a lot of hits because he was kind of the lone guy and really set the foundation for the Brazilian storm, quote unquote, to come in and do what they did. And, and I remember thinking like, um, because I'd, he, he came on tour at the same time I was doing it. And so he and I have known each other for a long time and thinking like, wow, like he, his accomplishments are so insane and he's such a good surfer. You know, when Gabriel won in 2014, there was a thought that like Adriano's contribution may have just been like clearing the path for that to happen. And I think it is really one of the greatest like unspoken uncelebrated achievements that that happened and then the next year adriano was like no no like i've got one in me and still did it like there's obviously a lot that happened that year with shark attacks and all sorts of things but like man i i am in awe that he was able to do that yeah, just I, psychologically you know i have a, a lot of respect for those guys and, and another person who i really love is jaddy i love jaddy he's been a great friend for a long time competing growing up and uh He's another one of those people who just exuded a certain kind of energy where it was like kinetic, you know, and he was out there and he w was so passionate and and really launching some big airs is when he came on the scene. And I just, man, those guys have such a special energy and I really respect those guys a lot. And we keep in touch on Instagram and I love surfing with them. And yeah, it's, it's really, it's cool, you know. You, you know what I've noticed with them through the years too, and it's not, it's not just them, it's not just the Brazilians, but certainly Adriano and Jadson come to mind, is there's a layer of humility, or there was when, they, and there still is, but when they qualified, they definitely had that. I think what you have a lot of times is you get that 
surfing industrial complex hype machine behind the new young thing and they qualify and they think, yeah, I'm here to win a world title. I don't have to get better, you know, or some version of that. And I always felt like Adriano and Jadson were like, oh, I have a lot to work on, you know, like Adriano, like stayed with Jamie O'Brien for six weeks just to learn how to surf pipe and like Jaddy, like committed to learning how to charge chopes and like develop a rail game. And, and again, those aren't the only two examples, but I do think like getting to the CT level is not the end of the development road. It's like, it's really the beginning in a lot of ways. Well, that's a, that's an interesting way to put it. I always felt that competing gave you like, um, you know, a degree right in college and it just helps you get to a level where you've established a skill set and you're, you're able to compete with your peers, but what are you going to do with that? Are you going to take it to another level on, you know, the championship tour and go and really dedicate your time and energy for a world title? Or, I mean, you can do sky's the limit really. And most of my really good friends that I've spent time in the last 10 years exploring the planet with looking for waves in really interesting places and interesting cultures I met on the QS, you know, guys like Kepa, Sarah, uh, Masatoshi Ono from Japan. Um, these are lifelong friends. And it's been funny because we grew up competing together uh, in some heats where you're like, you know, it was like battling and it was so fun, but we mutually respect each other as humans and surfers and f- first and foremost surfers. And the friendship just grew. And as soon as we stopped competing and there's so many different avenues to explore as a surfer. And uh, if you have an open mind and, and you you have a good community of people around you and you can you can see things that can change the way you view the world, you know, and it can happen through surfing. And it's such a beautiful thing. And I just I look back on the journey that I've had the opportunity to, to explore and and I'm thankful to have those friends and I'm thankful to have the time on the QS really establishing those relationships and and those helped me transfer to where I am today one hundred percent. And that was ten years ago. Sure. So it's it's cool. So walk me through the decision. I'd imagine there was some sort of decision. It might have been a snap decision, but <laughs> you're on the QS, you're sharpening your craft, you're having these experiences. And then just from a career standpoint, and maybe it's not that transactional, maybe you're just thinking, I want to start doing different things with my surfing. I'm going to start moving in this direction. What was that like? And, and what were this kind of steps you took to get there? Well, it was a really special time. I actually, I think I had achieved my best year ratings wise. I think I was 60th, which doesn't sound insane, but I was so super pumped. Well, actually, maybe that was a year before. I don't know, whatever. But it was so sick because Tanner and Patrick, we ended up having the heat together at sunset. I made it from the first round and then everyone was kind of seated sequentially. And somehow we ended up being together in the round of 32 at sunset. And Tanner needed to make that heat to qualify. Um, to join the, Patrick. Who was the fourth surfer in the uh, Mason. Right. Mason Hill. And <laughs> it was such a perfect day. That event had been huge. Probably some of the biggest sunset I can remember surfing. Uh, was it your like, day and Neve needed the Coast Guard to rescue him? Yeah. Back or something? The current was it was It was raging. insane. It was huge. <laughs> and it was such a perfect bookend to the moment when, you know, I worked really hard and I felt like, you know, for me, I love people. I really love my family and I would do anything for them, support them you know, through thick and thin. And I was always felt like, you know, on the road, like, hey, man, like backing them, like, let's go, let's go, you got this. And so when they actually got to a place of qualifying, both of them in the same year, it was just such a beautiful moment for me because I was like, man, I, I almost felt like I had fulfilled my role, you know, like they achieved their goal. And then now it was time for me to to step into my own world and and become responsible for myself and and evolve into a person, you know, as a whole. And when you go in the free surf route, it's kind of, um, people think it's maybe an easier option or it's a way out of the system, but I think it's kind of a, it's a sink or swim moment. Mm. You, it's really a fun, liberating experience because you, you have to work twice as hard to establish yourself and to, to really make an impact. So for me, I had the work ethic that was established on the QS cause I knew how hard it was and you never take a day for granted on that thing, yeah. you know? I, so I had the skill set of knowing how to book all your flights and how to operate on the road and how to get everything dialed logistically. So I felt like I had the skill set to do what I wanted to do as a free surfer. So it really was that moment in Hawaii when I said, let's go, baby. 
I'll see you at Snapper and then uh, I'll be doing my thing. And I think I was actually surfing Fiji, like an all time swell in Fiji. And the boys were at Bells or something at the same time. And I was just like, how good is this? We're both doing it. This is like what you live for. So, yeah. It's so special that you're able to actually, and kind of amazing, just the way the heat draw worked out, that you're actually in the water for that heat with your brothers, where, you know, there was actually this really sort of cosmic bookend to that part of your career, and you were starting a new one, and they were starting a new one. That's, that's, yeah. And I, I, you know, I have a ton of respect as a surfer for people who compete as well. Sure. So I, and well, my you, brothers, you did it. I like, did. I think that's, yeah. yeah. You know, like, and so I understand what it feels like to push yourself to to your limit, you know, to find like, hey, how deep can I dig right now? I want to make this thing happen. And I, I really respect the passion and everyone that's involved on the QS and the CT to, to get where they get. But for me, that system, it wasn't allowing me to operate to my fullest extent. You know, I, I just didn't perform well. I, I guess I see things more on a bigger picture than rather 20 minutes and um, and it is in scores and it, I'm not like an in the box kind of guy, which sure. people can probably understand when they listen to me. <laughs> but I think, um, it's just cool that everything can coexist. And I think there's a balance that, that helps both people stay buoyant when you have, uh, the success of, of both parties, you know, the free surfers and the competitors. You've seen Justin Gaines' uh, Margot film Vonderjar, Vonderjar. No. Oh man, it is. I'm I'm shocked, dude. I, this is up. I, I want to rip is up your alley. This is the Brendan Margeson story. Wow. And and maybe man, that three years between us might be showing itself right now. <laughs> <laughs> so so Justin Gaines Pulse Surf on Instagram. Oh, I like that account. That's he, a sick one. He rules. He did this amazing film on Brendan Margeson, basically chronicling him as one of the first like majorly paid free surfers in a way that really carved a path for a lot of people after him. And they've got all these great people in it. It's amazing surfing. There's still some like winky pop Bell's Beach surfing in there that stands up to this day. And I remember a comment from Bugs, um, Wayne Bartholomew, he's in it. And he's in it at a time when he was the ASP president and he was really positive on Margo. And he was saying, he goes something to the effect of, yeah, it's not easy being a free surfer because you have to be really, really, really good and getting as much exposure, if not more than the guys on tour. And Brendan had done a lot of the development work, kind of like you said, like he'd gone to school, like he'd done the junior program, he'd done the QS, he'd gotten his degree. And I do think that's important because I think a lot of people look at free service and they're like, I don't want to do the NSSAs or the pro junior and the QS. And that's okay. But I think like every single one of those guys that's elevated up there in the free surfing kind of stratosphere got their technical grounding because they were pushing it and sharpening themselves around a group of people. Sometimes that's in competition. Well, yeah. I mean, I remember, I think Ando was even doing the pro junior series when I was doing it in Australia. So you, everyone starts somewhere. And, uh, you know, I, I like to think of it, you know, I was thinking about this earlier that like, if you look at a musician and, you know, a tour surfer would be playing, their goal is to play the song and, and it's got to be in tune and on time and perf their goal is perfection, right? You get a 10 point ride per the conditions. Whereas the free servers have the opportunity to kind of explore between the notes and play off key for a bit and see what feels different. And you can engage a different part of the mind or look at the wave and kind of play around with certain things. You have a little bit more opportunity. Well, you've, you've got tons of opportunity because you got plenty of time, but uh, it just got, I mean, the, the tour, you're looking at the level and you're going, oh my goodness, these guys are surfing lights out, yeah. you know, on great waves and it's crazy like and it just keeps evolving but i think in free surfing it's a beautiful time even now when you're seeing different board design happening and you're seeing the nuances and the ability to you can how do i say i mean you can go straight and it's interesting like you're getting feedback and you're playing around with things and then when you really want to sew that together with a big turn in a sequence of a combination you're going to approach it just a little differently than the guy who's been trying to make sure that things are on track to getting that perfect score. Does that make sense? Totally. I, and I, I think that the note about like equipment experimentations, so right. And the, the, unfortunately, and I understand why the very rare times it happens at the CT level, 
it's so magical. Like whether it's like Kelly on the wizard sleeve at Snapper or like Dane on the MTFA at Senos, like or the dumpster ever at Lowers. Exactly. Like, and it's or Wardo on the the round nose at Snapper. <laughs> yes, like Chris. the equipment conversation, like there's so many interesting designs and there's so many different ways you can apply it to world class surfing that in those moments where guys experiment a little bit. It's really interesting. It is interesting. And I, I love to see them play around with it in the context of pressure and the time of the heat and and with that audience. But yeah, I mean, for as a free server, I just feel fortunate to have the opportunity and the platform to, you know, have interesting conversations about design or approach. And I mean, hanging out with people like, you know, on the Vans team, we grew up, you know, the last 10 years hanging out with Joel Tudor and Nathan Fletcher, who arguably approached the wave more unique and different than most, you know, on different ends of the spectrum. So you're seeing a cool opportunity, you know, in my development to kind of be around these kind of characters who see things differently than I had been exposed to growing up doing the contest. Yeah. So, but having that as a backbone, plus the now, you know, open mind of exploring the wave with speed and um, what are you going to do with it? Or don't do anything with it. Just enjoy it. And, and, playing with that the balance like a stick shift you know the gas and clutch and at an old 72 panel bus in hawaii and, and that was playing with the uh the, <laughs> the rhythm but it's the truth in that comparison to surfing it's you know a little gas a little clutch and bang you're gonna pop that thing off um I to totally like I, I think i love that analogy one of the things that you hear sometimes when guys decide to stop doing the qs or stop doing the ct is you know a sense of sort of like listlessness or or sort of treading water in that you know surfing is a, a pretty free exercise to begin with and having like a contest or a tour kind of gives you just a little bit of structure to the point where you're like okay like i'm gonna surf this wave to practice for that event which is coming up in a month and not that that's perfect but when you decided to step away did you get any kind of like well i'm a little bit paralyzed by all the options i have in a way. And that goes back to that first question that you asked me, like, what do I do? And I, I, there's not one single thing. And I think that would probably be too much for some people to bear that much. You know, it's just almost a burden to be like, well, you can do anything, but it's, it's, it's kind of overwhelming. But no, I, I felt like I had a passion for surfing or a f affinity for surfing kind of heavier left-hand barrels. You know, I spent a lot of time at Pipeline and hanging out, met with Reef McIntosh and Danny Fuller and those guys. And uh, Vans had a house at the time right there at, you know, at Pipeline, one of the new houses that I think is now the WSL house. And I just feel so fortunate. I basically, right off the tour, I, I you know, I love big barrels that are left <laughs> in, in warm water. It's so beautiful. And, uh, you know, I wanted to pursue that passion. And, you know, I remember hearing stories that Braden Diaz was like, you know, Pipeline is the religion. You know, you got to treat these waves um almost as if it is your personal religion and so dedicating the time and passion to those pursuits um i didn't feel like i was you know listless or something like right, that yeah. i felt grounded in my pursuit because it felt like a higher calling you know when you when you invest something that deeply into surfing um with that much passion and dedication to learning um, you know, again, I was just a kid from California, T Street, and trying to learn how to surf these heavy kind of waves and engage with the crowd and um, understand the, the community. And I think it was just a really special developmental time, which the, from there, that education, you know, take it to cloud break, which is super special wave from my heart. It's probably, probably the number one, you know, most special wave that I can think of. I, I get chicken skin when I just dream about that wave. And you know, I had the time to develop a lot of uh, experiences out there and go and just learn, you know, I'd be in the lineup and with John Roseman and Kelly Slater, and I'd just be watching the way their heads would be moving when sets would be coming. It's a really hard wave to pick the right one. I mean, I've picked more closeouts than most people could even imagine. And through that process, you, you, you end up sifting to a place where you can find good ones. So yeah, the South Pacific, Tahiti, Chopu, and again, just being a constant student you know, I think that allowed me to stay grounded and to always want to improve and and how to pursue that um, was awesome. I mean, the South Pacific was one chapter, but then 
there's been so many, you know, cold water with Chris Burkhardt and all those guys going on trips and surfing in the snow for the first time getting, I mean, that was fascinating to me too. It was like, do you know what it's like to, to literally almost like freeze in the, when you're surfing? I mean, you're surfing for hours and hours and hours and it's so fun. You don't want to get out of the water, but your mind is sharp, but your body's shutting down. And you're like, you're so, I was so happy to enjoy that and to understand what that feels like that I couldn't stop thinking about it. That's such an interesting answer back to the listlessness point, right? Because you're right. Like the North Shore is such a project to invest all your focus. It's almost like um, like a band focusing on the next album, you know, where it's like, we're going to do the white album now. And your white album could have very well been like, I'm going to use my relationship with Vans to spend time here. You know, Vans this year is celebrating the 37th year of the Triple Crown. The North Shore is a sacred place. Like I always felt like you and your brothers had a ton of respect for those events when you were doing the QS, where it was Holly Eva or Sunset and Pipe. And then, yeah, that makes a ton of sense being able to channel all this sort of talent and experience and energy into getting very, very good at a very special place. And in Hawaii, like you just mentioned, it teaches you about respect, self-respect, respecting the ocean, respecting the community. And, and we were, you know, like I said, we're from San Clemente. So being a visitor there, it just, it was really kind to be able to have access to surfing that wave. And, and it was just a really cool development. I mean, you take that same attitude of respect towards others and so forth with you around the world. So, I mean, again, when you're looking at the developmental stages of, of my own life with the, you know, you have the QS background and the community aspect, and then you go to Hawaii and you learn, learn how to, you know, handle yourself in, in not only heavy conditions, but, um, you know, learning about respecting communities and so forth. And then you go to around the world and, and it's, it does provide you with a really good grounding, um, tool set. You guys mentioned you had the panel van in Hawaii. Oh yeah. Did you get a chance to ride in that thing? Uh, no. Oh, it's, but it's gone. It's gone now. Though, I think right? it almost burned so many times. It was, <laughs> it was, it was crazy. It was barely running, but it would break down. We pull off the side of the road, but you don't have anywhere to go. You just take a three hour nap and it'll turn over. <laughs> well, I, I want to know how long would you stay there? Like on the North shore? Like what would, the, I mean, I know it's every trip's different, but like you're fresh off of the QS and that chapter of your career, you're dedicating yourself to this. You, you got a vehicle over there. What does it look like? You're there off season, you're spending X amount of time. Yeah. I don't know. It's just, I wanted to sharpen my tool set and really get some hardy experience. Um, so I'd spent, you know, four or five months. Um, yeah. And hang out, you know, that's, that's significant, man. Like that's yeah. especially for someone who's been it well, a not based there, but B he's been basically traveling the world on the QS like that. Yeah, that felt weird to stay in one like place. Almost becomes like the first home yeah. for you in a lot of ways for a lot of years. And I'm so thankful. I mean, yeah, the Cole crew at Vans was awesome. Kalani Chaps and John John was growing up. So the Florence family and Nathan Fletch and, uh, you know, Reef would always take me under the wing. I, you know, so much, so much gratitude for those guys helping me in the lineup and just saying, hey, check this out. You know, look at the swell direction this day. What are you seeing? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like helping you understand the bigger picture rather than being like, here's a wave, go, you know, is it kind right. of challenging you to, to learn about what's happening in the ocean. And I think that was such a valuable asset and to have it for a prolonged amount of time. And that was probably, you know, two or three years straight, I think, you know, the culmination, the coolest thing I ever got to be a part of is one of the Dahui shootouts. I was on the Vans team and that was always something we grew up with, like the sickest video. We had a VHS of one and and just the rides and the quality and the opportunity to serve pipeline in that kind of a, uh, you know, aspect. I was just like so honored to get selected from Vans, and I was just it was a highlight for me at the time. It was a culmination of these things, and I remember getting one beautiful wave in the morning on a six ten, and I was just like, man, this is freaking just what I I'm right where I wanted to be, you know. And and it also feels like an awesome validation of the time you put in you know, because that's not something that they give to anybody, you know, and it's like, you know, there's not necessarily contest results or QS rankings or qualification that's in that career pipeline, but you've invested yourself at dimensionalizing yourself as a surfer. And that's actually being paid out just through the opportunity to compete at the shootout. Yeah. And I mean, for me, that was a highlight of my life, you know, one of them, you know, I think, sure. and pipeline is such a special wave. I mean, uh, all the waves I've, I've had the chance to surf and Pipeline's still probably one of the most 
uh, impactful when you're staring at it and you're looking down the face when you're looking to drop over the ledge. Uh, there's nothing else that can even compare. It's so interesting and vertical and and ledgy in the angle it's breaking. It's just heavy. It's the heaviest, heaviest wave still, in my opinion. It's actually, I, I love that it, in the schedule, continues most seasons to be kind of the arbiter for the world champ. You know, and this year, we've got five surfers in the running, right? We've got Italo, Gabrielle, Jordi, Felipe, and Kolohe. I, I just love the idea that it kind of comes down to this. I, I don't know if there's another venue that really does it justice year in and year out. Um, are you giving any thoughts to the season's title race? you have any picks? Oh, man. I, everyone just serves insane. Um, I mean, obviously, you got to cheer for Kolohe. He's a San Clemente boy. You know, he's putting putting USA on his back and, and running it hard. And uh, I, I think him, in my opinion on him is actually him being kind of the underdog is a great place for him. Yeah. Because he is so freakishly talented. Um, and I think, you know, you get that mega hot spotlight just shining a little bit stage left to him. And he probably is a little more comfortable to do his thing, you know, and play spoiler. And he's really passionate, man. He wakes up with purpose every day. And I know he's been working so hard for many, many, many years. So this is a realization of a dream to be able to have the opportunity to go for that cup. But yeah, I mean, he's just qualified for the Olympics too. So, I mean, it's just uh, it's an exciting future. And I know for the next generation of kids in San Clemente too, he's a, he's a really big idol, you know, for a lot of the kids. You know, the Colapinto's looking up to him. Cade Matson's on fire. The Cole Hushman, uh, Taj Lindblad. We have... Crano. I mean, San Clemente has got such a cool depth right now, and I feel like it's a really um, everyone's got like that good buzz energy where they want to go for it. They want to support each other. They want to all rise to the top, and by virtue of that, I think there's going to be some fantastic results coming. If it doesn't happen this year, it's going to be for the next 10 years. I mean, hopefully someone from San Clemente will be making a charge. Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those things, you know, having us kind of grow up in the same area, just seeing this there was always talent in San Clemente. You got these amazing natural resources in the sense of high performance wave and lowers and all these beach breaks and just great training ground for people. Um, and it just feels like most people in Southern California, um, if their kids want to be pro surfers or even outside of Southern California are kind of like converging on San Clemente in a lot of ways. I, I, I feel like an old dinosaur because I still do the walk to lowers when I'm in town and like the amount of electric <laughs> bikes that buzz by me, I'm just like, holy smokes. Um, it's, <laughs> You're like, I'm a speed bump. <laughs> I, I, yeah, and then I go out in the water and I'm still a speed bump. So, oh man, yeah. So it's, it, but I do think it's so interesting, right? Because it's this idea of lineage and legacy. And when you and your brothers are growing up, there was a generation ahead of you guys that, really took you under their wing and developed you in their own way. Do you feel like you're playing that role for a lot of the kids coming up to? It's been a fantastic um, thing to grow up in San Clemente surfing the waves. And we, you know, we were in Capo Beach until fourth grade and then uh, moved down to San Clemente at the time. And um, at the time it was insane. It was like the lost crew was in full effect. You know, Corey Lopez, the Lopez brothers would be in town all the time. Chris was ripping super big the Bessians were both there still Archie was ripping I mean you had these guys and you'd be surfing the waves with them and and two behind those guys were just a bunch of San Clemente guys who could hold their own with anybody as well that weren't on the pro level um so yeah I mean just being in the Fletcher's gee whiz so having that you know I mean we're talking about a bunch of radical people who saw the wave differently so growing up in that environment but still, they maintained a cool sense of a community. You know, uh, Chris was all Chris Ward. He always looked out for us in the lineup. He would, he would, he would always remember your name. You'd be all pumped up, and it was just a, you know, as a kid growing up, you had people that you could look up to and aspire to, kind of emulate them on the wave and X, Y, and Z. Um, and now, being kind of, you know, early thirties and having the opportunity to look at the future generation um, and keep keep them inspired and engaged. Um, it's just a fantastic, fantastic opportunity. And we've done uh, the San Clemente Stokerama event, which is uh, something we do at Vans, my brothers and I, just a youth free surfing event for the kids, basically like their first entry into competition. Um, 12 and under is the oldest division. So we've been doing that for eight years now in San Clemente and the community just comes out in waves. There's so many kids, it's just mind blowing. And, and their attitude's really, really cool. You know, I feel like the consciousness of 
of the kids in the community is at a really good place right now. And it does it does seem like Stokerama is one of those things where it's using competition inclusively to build community. Like all those kids and their parents and their families, they just they kind of turn up because they want to be a part of something. Whereas, you know, 20, 30 years ago, maybe competition was a little more isolating, right? Where it was like, well, no, we're here to figure out like the very best at the expense of everyone else. And not that it's not like you want to be pushed. You want to you want to see surfing progress. You want to see the world's best. I think world champions are fucking awesome. But it is cool, especially at that really young age where people just like, oh, I went to the contest. I met my best friend. And I think what that allows is surfing to grow. You know, I think we're looking at a time right now when surfing is being utilized in so many different capacities for a positive thing. Um, you know, you're seeing it go growing onto the Olympic stage. And you're going, yeah, that's that's phenomenal. And as a result of that, there's so much more attention brought to surfing and people coming around surfing. I mean, we're going to communities doing the board drives and stuff through the foundation. And, you know, you're in Nigeria and stuff and they're talking about surfing in the Olympics and they're having purpose and they're feeling compelled to cheer each other on and, and improve or, you know, in Jamaica and, you know, you could be in Canada. And I mean, all these emerging surf communities and countries are now excited to feel a purposeful, you know, approach to building the community and getting people on board. And, and then too, I was just at a surfing summit the other day for surf therapy. And they're finding that surfing has just become this healing vehicle, which we all already know as a surfer. But I mean, you know, people suffering from autism, cystic fibrosis, veterans coming back from war, dealing with, you know, personal struggles in your community. It's fantastic. There's community, there's organizations all around the world doing great work using surfing as surf therapy. So yeah, when you look at the Stokerama compared to just a conventional surf contest where you win or you lose, it's more about seeing people come together as a community, supporting each other and allowing surfing to be the vehicle for you to grow as a human. Totally. And I just love when the potential is for all these things to tie together because it's all surfing, you know, where it's like, there's the therapy aspect, there's the community aspect, there's the mentorship aspect, there's competition, there's free surfing, there's video, there's art. All these different pieces make all the other pieces that much better when there's that connective tissue, as opposed to when they're kind of quarantined off from different spaces. And I get it, like, you know, there's actions and reactions and people like to develop things as sort of an alternative to something that exists. But man, I, I just always like kind of ingesting all of it um, which I, I genuinely think you kind of as a human being are almost a vessel for it because you've just taken in so many different parts of surfing through your 33 years. Yeah, and and I've always kind of felt in my heart that no matter everything, like the further it goes in each direction, there will always be an equal and opposite reaction that will be of equal significance. So it's for people who are concerned that surfing is going into the Olympics, it's going to be blown out of proportion or not understood correctly. In my opinion, there'll always be a subculture that will be re-inspired, reinvigorated and rise up to equal significance. So I think it's all going to work out. And I just feel so fortunate to have surfing in my life play a role that um, allows you to grow as a human and and see different cultures and communities. And, and too, I feel like I've been a positive and a negative influence on my brother's past too, because, you know, they've dedicated time for competing, you know, hardcore and Patrick and Taryn both qualified for the CT. But I mean, at the same time, I was, I was pulling on their coattails and going, Hey boys, there's a big world out here, you know, and, and, and there's a lot of cool things happening. So, so go get what you want to get and I'll be right here and ready for you when, when you're ready to uh, get rogue and, and, do some really outside the box kind of stuff. But I think that's huge too. And I think it's not just your brothers. I think it's a lot of those kids that look up to you in San Clemente as well, because you, whether it's through equipment design with Channel Islands or just your ability to explore different approaches and different parts of the wave, it's like you're pushing the envelope in your own way. And, you know, not everything's going to work but you're going to learn a shit ton through it. And then that can kind of get incorporated back into your just ongoing approach or other people's ongoing approaches. Yeah. And I think for me, the biggest, I mean, it fu sounds funny to say this, but you, I don't want everything to work out for me in terms of that's how you, that stunts your growth capacity. You know, when you're, you know, sometimes when I go into a turn, I've been working on this with Tanner, I'm like, don't be afraid to, to just eat 
crap for millions of times. Like getting a feels like you're getting in a car crash when you're laying over the rail super hard and you're driving back into the pocket on a heavy five foot wave and it's coming down on your back when you get to the thing. But sooner or later, you're going to figure out how to how to make that move. And you got to get into radical situations to learn how to get yourself out of them. So I think uh, thinking in that way, regardless of whether it's dropping in on a certain big wave, how to position yourself. And I mean, I don't want to call it a reckless mindset, but I think you have to be courageous to, to be like, Hey, it's all good. I, I don't care if I fall on my face in front of all these people, I'm going to figure it out. And as a result of it, it's going to be, something's going to happen. I mean, it could be magic. I, I think it's, I think it makes total sense. It's, it's get comfortable being uncomfortable. It's like you read about Patrick Mahomes practicing and he practices throwing at the worst uncomfortable angles imaginable. It's not always going to work, but he's like, but I get comfortable doing it. So I'm confident to do it, you know? And that's, I, I think that's a real parallel in a lot of ways. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's so fun. I just like, man, serving is so sick. I just get stoked now that we're talking about it and just getting these flashbacks from experiences. But yeah, you really do learn and experiences and you have to challenge yourself constantly. And it goes back to, you know, the moment you take the risk to stop competing um, and have that safety of the infrastructure, right? You can always say, hey, at the year end, you go to your sponsor, you say, I was this rating you know, or this, I did something, you know, whereas free serving, it's, it's more of a, a feeling and you, and you really have to dedicate yourself to the passion and the, to the craft and, and to the history of surfing. And, um, you have to, you know, wake up and, and have the same passion day in and day out. So, um, I wouldn't say it's easier. It's, but it's sure been satisfying. Like, um, and I think the journey's to start. And there's so many things I'm excited about for the future. And and I think there's no wave that's the same. So the approach and everything just keeps evolving in your conversations and the weight distribution of your board writing. Oh, man, it's just endless. And that's it's like a Rubik's Cube, you know? What's the most, uh, what's the thing you're most excited about doing in 2020? Oh, man, what? Oh, I'm excited, but I can't tell you because it's good. <laughs> no, no, I, I want to keep surfing. Uh, you know, I got some some spots I'm looking at for, um, you know, some big barrels. Um, so that would be really exciting. I mean, shoots, I watched Russell Burke's um, edit that came out and that gave me chicken skin, brother. That was unreal. Just airdropping at shippies. And I love people really pushing the envelope to, to make, forcing you to see things in a way that you're like, oh, okay, so that's possible now. Like, let's let's do it. Um, that's what we're talking about. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah, and, and it takes someone being courageous to push over the ledge and you know going for it. And now a lot of times you're gonna wipe out, but I tell you what, when you make that thing, man, that's gonna be a feeling you're never gonna forget. So, all right, before we go, we have the lightning round. Okay, lightning round. Okay, I'm gonna say it again. We have the lightning round. They're gonna insert. Is there a theme they're song? Gonna, they're gonna insert thunder, which isn't <laughs> lightning, but it was close. <laughs> no. Okay. So answer these as quickly as you can. Okay. One board set up for the rest of your life: single fin, twin fin, thruster, quad bonds, or finless. Ooh. Um, probably single fin. Coffee or tea? Um, coffee. Burrito or pizza? Burrito. Last book you read? Mm, the Mike Hinson autobiography. Best surf film ever. Uh, and the summer. <laughs> I'm just going to keep it right on my Kinson vibes. One wave you never have to go back to. Oh, that means, I don't know. I'm not, I don't really hate waves too much. If you only get to surf one wave for the rest of your life. Cloud break. Best person to share a lineup with. Uh, the dolphins. Worst person to share a lineup with. Mm, birds that poop on your head. Finish this sentence. I will next achieve a state of happiness by waking up. <laughs> Dan Godowskis, thank you for joining us on the lineup. Sweet, Dave. Thanks so much. Have a good day, you guys. All right, that's it. That is our conversation with Dan Godowskis. I hope you enjoyed it. 
If you haven't subscribed to the show yet, please do so wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're listening to this when we dropped it, we are on the eve of the 2019 Men's World Title Showdown between Italo Ferreira, Jordi Smith, Felipe Toledo, Gabriel Medina, and Colohe Andino at the upcoming Billabong Pipe Masters the final event of the Vans Triple Crown of Surfing. So be sure to watch that. Action starts on December 8th, and you can watch at worldsurfleague.com or the WSL app. We'll be back next Friday, and we'll talk to you then.